Um, I'm here with Marissa Cranfill, who is the founder of Yochi, uh, Yochi.com, Y-O-Q-I.com. She's also a film and video director, and you can find a lot of her videos at YouTube.com slash Yochi, Y-O-Q-I. Uh, welcome. It's wonderful to have you, Marissa. Thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Um, the reason that I invited Marissa to be here is because over the years uh, in my own practice with meditation and Kriya Yoga, uh, one of my favorite exercise routines has always been uh, Qigong. And Marissa is a wonderful, talented uh, Qigong teacher. I was recently introduced to her work probably about a year and a half ago. Um, and I've been incorporating uh, what she does have available uh, before my meditation practices, uh, after I do some uh, a little more aggressive exercises to calm my nervous system down. So I've invited her today to talk to us about the benefits of Qigong and how it impacts um, our ability to go deep into meditation. So uh, Marissa, as we're getting started here, would you mind telling us um, how you first became involved in Qigong and how did you begin this whole process of yours? Sure, well, I actually started with meditation. Uh, Buddhist meditation. So I went to school with a program that took me to Japan and um, started with Zen training in the Zendos there in Japan and ended up for my senior year in school in China. And I did a, wrote a thesis on comparative meditation technique within the Buddhist tradition. So I was looking at Pure Land Zen and then the Vipassana tradition from Thailand, mm -hmm. because I have connections in Thailand from my family in my childhood. And while, so I started with meditation. And while I was at school, I decided to take Tai Chi class. I had taken a couple before in America just for fun. So I knew what it was about, but never really gone deep. And a lot of the foreign students took it. So we would all gather on the track field at the university. This was um, Hangzhou University in China. And we would gather after class and the master would come and we would do our Tai Chi. And one day the master didn't show up for class. So, uh, sorry, the students didn't show up for class. It was just me and the master. And he asked me if I wanted to learn Qigong. And I had only seen books in, um, in the library with little pictures of guys doing these, these exercises. And I said, sure, I'll try it. So he said, okay, let's go to the forest. And I was like, oh, okay, this is interesting. Just me and you, we're gonna go to the forest. <laughs> and he had me do the jump standing like a tree position in front of a tree. And it was standing meditation. And I was like, wow, this is so cool because Tai Chi is, is very difficult when you are a beginner. Um, it's really focusing on memorizing each movement and really focusing on your alignment and your structure. So you're not going deep into the chi meditative aspect so much in the beginning. Whereas with Qigong, it was like, boom, he just put me in this posture, told me to breathe with the tree and empty my mind. It was like, well, I can do that. I've been practicing meditation for a couple of years already. So now you're integrating the body awareness with the energy and the nature. And so I just fell in love with this concept and um, explored more masters, more teachers and started learning Qigong from there. Mm -hmm. And later when I moved to Thailand, I dove deeper into a yoga practice because that was available. And, you know, of course, yoga is available everywhere and they had amazing uh, studios there and teachers. So uh, that's when I started the yoga and then I didn't want to lose the Qigong. So I kind of brought them together in my own practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm curious how that worked for you because uh, as a meditation teacher, I've always personally preferred Qigong practice to yoga practice. However, I always thought as well that they seemed like they would go very well together that they are might use different names like chi or prana but they're essentially kind of doing the same thing so how did how did that work for you bringing those two things together i love it because yoga it, it's interesting there's just something about the qigong and martial arts training that that yoga fills this gap it's 
it's this stretching and the different postures of yoga that don't they don't have in the qigong in the martial arts mm -hmm. um, and the martial arts in the qigong fill the gap where the yoga for me didn't mm -hmm. um now when we talk about yoga of course we can say well what kind of yoga and um are we talking about vinyasa yoga hatha yoga american yoga kriya yoga there's so many yogas but if we just look at okay yoga as taking the posture and holding the posture for five breaths and then moving into another posture. Um, it can be quite linear. And I know modern yoga has transformed into flow into, you know, mandala yoga, but just saying the linear classic yoga, um, whereas Qigong is more repetitive and this repetition allows you to relax and use this 70% effort principle with movement. Mm -hmm. and still maintaining proper structure and but moving with chi and so these principles i started understanding can be applied the same to yoga and the outcome is actually very similar i mean it all ends the same way it's prana or chi it's awareness and it's opening up the meridians in the body mm -hmm. so in the end we're doing the same thing it's just we're getting there in a different way and I was exploring doing a yoga practice first and then ending with Qigong flow or starting with Qigong warm-ups, doing some yoga and then doing flow. And then I started incorporating the flow actually into my yoga practice, mm -hmm. which is where Yoji uh, kind of flowered for me as my own thing or its own thing. Um, of course, it's not a classical traditional thing in any way, but it's a fusion and I enjoy it, um, but it still can be practiced separately. You can do your yoga practice and then some Qigong flow and then your meditation and it all works in a very beautiful stream as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people ask me about when is a good time to do a practice like yoga or Qigong? And, you know, in, in classical yoga, the idea would be you would do your asana practice first to calm down the mind, to balance the prana flows and so on. So then you could go deeper into meditation. Uh, when I first began doing meditation, I would often find that doing yoga after or Qigong after was good because it was as if during the meditation, I had either accumulated a bunch of energy or was just feeling very uh, energized. And then by doing the Qigong or by doing uh, the yoga practice, it was as though I was integrating that. So I'm curious, do you have any thoughts on when is a good time to do a practice such as Yochi um, before or after meditation? Yes, traditionally before um, to clear out, purge out negative energy, clear the mind and center and get your, your, mind, body, and spirit balanced and harmonized. And then when you sit, it can be easier to sit for a longer period of time because you've already got yourself in a balanced state. I mean, that's the, that's kind of the theory, but doing meditation before is also great because you're, by sitting, you're also calming the mind and calming down and bringing yourself into center and working with the energy and then you can move that energy in specific patterns and ways when you move into the yoga and qigong practice mm -hmm. so you know in in traditional training like in shaolin let's just say um martial arts or qigong shaolin qigong they do morning meditation first right when they wake up at 5 a.m in a temple in china mm -hmm. i mean you, you get up and you meditate some nuns will get up earlier, but most of the nuns I observed, we all woke up at the bell at 5 a.m. or 4.30 a.m. and we meditated right straight away. And then we did morning chanting. And then you would see then breakfast. And then you would see some of the nuns practicing um, qigong outside. So that's, that's in the temple how they do it as well. They'll meditate before their mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. And I'm not uh, very familiar with uh, Buddhist practices, uh, really, but uh, I have heard uh, about uh, vipassana and those types of practices and how they're they're, they're very they seem to go for a very very long time, <laughs> and so I'm curious. Um, when I've sat for longer uh, doing particular kinds of pranayama or, or the Kriya Yoga techniques, um, I would find that it would be good to maybe take 10 or 15 minutes after you've been sitting for a while to do something like Qigong, just to get your body moving and to 
uh, get yourself more uh, invigorated or back into the practice. Um, is that true with the kind of traditions you're used to with meditation or is it mainly just, okay, we're going to sit here for hours and we're just, that's what we're doing. Uh, well, in, in like Vipassana tradition, there's sitting and there's walking. Mm -hmm. There is not, we, they don't do any pranayamas okay. actually. Um, they just didn't interpret the text from the Buddha in that way for that. Mm -hmm. So they sit and they walk and they sit and they walk. Mm -hmm. And the walking is the yang and the sitting is the yin. Oh. So the walking is actually the, the, um, the active movement to get the blood and chi circulating part. And it builds a lot of chi. And so when you walk, walk for 20, 30 minutes, even an hour, and then you sit, you have so much energy. It's a beautiful way to alternate the practice. Um, in the in the Mahayana tradition in China, and which would be Japan and Korea and um, in that area, they are more active during the day. So they play um, like ping pong and they they clean a lot. They you know fetch water, chop wood. In in Japan, they say so they're moving and they're sweeping. They sweep a lot the temple, and that's kind of their activity. Um, so the most Qigong oriented kind of tradition in Buddhism is the Shaolin tradition, whereas Qigong comes from Taoist, actually, it's Taoist original tradition, and it has its roots in shamanism and working with the spirit and working with healing. So it went its way and made its way into traditional Chinese medicine, which is where you have the medical Qigong which is how we apply Qigong for healing the body through the energy body, but also working with the organs and the blood. Right, right. So all of this um, is integrated into the Qigong flow that we do. And if you've taken Qigong, like you might not know anything about Chinese medicine, but most likely most of the movements that you're doing are based in Chinese medicine. Yeah. Okay. And so this is similar to um, the, the Qigong practices then are similar to what um, the yoga practices would be f f if you were incorporating that into like a, an Ayurvedic lifestyle. Is that accurate? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like if you go to Ayurvedic ashram spa in, you know, South India, or you're going to have the yoga class with the massages and the food and everything all together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And are there... Um, you know, in Ayurveda, we, we have this idea that we have these different kinds of doshas or different kinds of constitutions. We have kapha types, pitta types, and, and so on. And so oftentimes the uh, asana practice is tailored to that. Is, it, is that similar with Qigong or is it more that by doing a certain set of principles, it's going to have a positive effect no matter your constitution? Does that question make sense? Yeah, definitely. So Qigong in Chinese medicine, there's five elements and the five elements lean towards certain constitutions of personality and body types, just like in Ayurveda. So, but since there's three doshas in Ayurveda and there's five in Chinese, so, you know, we, we love to make these comparisons and try to make everything match perfectly, but it's not so, it's not like that, but you can, you could say pitta is the fire element and kapha is the water element and um, vata is the, they don't have air. So we have metal in Chinese. So metal would be vata. And then wood, this is like, it's kind of the, the extra one, you know, it doesn't have a match. <laughs> um, and earth is also very kappa. Earth and water are like kappa because, so in Qigong, yes. And in Yochi system, this is my whole system is based on the five elements and on the, the phases of energy flow. So we can actually create routines. This is what I teach people is how to design a Qigong flow routine. If your water element is excessive or your earth element is deficient, and then you can create a routine to boost that deficiency working with the five element theory. Yeah. Well, and the next question I have, uh, maybe it'll be controversial, maybe it won't. Um, even though my main focus uh, has been on uh, Vedic traditions, um, when it comes to practices like uh, exercises, I've always preferred Qigong, Tai Chi, 
that's that's what I've been drawn to. Yoga is fine. I can do it. I can enjoy it. But it was always like uh, the, the Qigong practice that that I, I would look more forward to. Um, and even uh, though I studied Ayurveda and spent a lot of time uh, involved in that, and I don't know a whole lot about traditional Chinese medicine, given the option, most of the time I would kind of choose <laughs> someone who's schooled in uh, traditional Chinese medicine. So since you've got uh, an understanding, or from what I can understand, you have an understanding of both. Um, do you do you try to combine them in a way like you, you were discussing, or do you lean more towards one or the other? I'm assuming you probably lean a little more towards the traditional Chinese medicine approach of things. I do because I've, I've spent a lot of time in India. Um, I've been to the Ayurvedic spas. So I've like had the experience for myself of Ayurveda, but I'm not trained in Ayurveda. And okay. I don't see the need to mix the two um, unless it was something of personal interest or hobby. You know, mm -hmm. I think that it's more effective to keep these systems on their own. I mean, it's like, it's like trying to travel to China and India in one vacation. It's just too much to take in and it's not necessary. So um, I keep, I really keep the, it leans towards Chinese medicine, what I teach basically. Mm -hmm. And I, I bring in the asana um, based on the meridians. So when we, it's just like yin yoga, you know, Paul Grilly um, has learned yin yoga from Pali Zink, who was a martial artist, and he adapted it to his yogic background. So he's doing that too. And he teaches how the meridians are affected in each yin yoga posture from a Chinese view, but he uses the Vedic, all the Vedic um, philosophy in his teaching. So it's an interesting mix that he does. Um, so yes, I, I lean more towards the Chinese philosophy and the Chinese even energy body. So I work with the three Dan Tian more than I work with the chakras. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't mix chakras and Dan Tian in one class. Mm -hmm. If I was going to teach a class with chakras, we would just work with chakras and Dan Tian, we just work with Dan Tian because they're different energy bodies, but they overlap. Mm -hmm. um, like obviously the, the middle Dan Tian is the heart and the heart chakra is the heart too. So you have energies too, and these two energy centers there, they overlap. Yeah, but it's better to keep them separate, in my opinion. Okay. Where I feel that it's where I feel that it's good to cross over is through the flow and through the asana with the postures. So what I like to do is match the asana that affect certain meridians, or we're working with certain organs, and with the flows that affect and move the chi through those organs. Mm -hmm. So when I design a routine, I always have a theme, and I work with the six phases of chi flow. And if you work with these six phases of chi flow, you can create and design a routine that's very effective and safe, and you can start to integrate yoga and qigong together in a good way. Okay. And, um, you know, as I, as I mentioned, I'm not sure if we were recording yet when I, when I brought this up, but um, I've been doing qigong on my own for m almost 20 years now. And uh, mainly it's this one series of movements, this 18 forms that I learned t two decades ago. And I've been doing that consistently over and over and over again. And then when I was introduced to your work, um, I noticed that there are a lot of, there's a lot of overlap, a lot of similarities, and you know, some of the themes also seem to have similar kinds of movements. Um, I'm curious, do you, uh, do you, do you find it's better to have um, a, a few diverse routines versus maybe what I've been doing, which is the same 18 <laughs> movements for the last 20 years? Do you have any thoughts on that? <clears throat> It's great to have to stick with one routine for at least three months. Okay, um, that's <laughs> so what I, did I do it, in did my too practice. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very seasonal. <laughs> if it's a, but I mean a, a form you can do for years. It's the beauty of the form. I see them like recipes. Mm -hmm. So if you have a good chicken soup recipe, I mean you can make your chicken soup recipe for your whole life and enjoy it, and it's going to be good for you. Mm -hmm. but you can also change it up too a little bit. And if you add a dash of this, a dash of that, and it still tastes good and feels good, there's nothing wrong with it. If you add a dash of this and that, and it doesn't taste good, you know that like, I'm not going to do that. So that's how I feel about Qigong and energy. And, and 
I also have forms in my personal practice that I tend to just go back to those same old forms and just do them as well, mm-hmm. for sure. And um, usually for me, they coordinate to the seasons because I like to connect to the energy of the season and the organ of the season. But then you have these classic like the Baduan gene, which is the eight silk brocades. It's a very famous form. And yeah, I love this form. And every time I do it, I say to myself, I should just do this form. <laughs> like it's so effective. It's so lovely. Um, yeah. So either way, I think it's really a personal thing. And there's thousands and thousands of styles of Qigong. Right. You know, that's so it's kind of fun to explore. Mm-hmm. And when so when I've been observing the videos that I've seen so far of yours, um, when I'm watching them, I'm thinking to myself, yes, this feels like we're doing Qigong here, obviously. Um, so I haven't quite nailed yet where exactly the yo part comes in. So when I, when I'm watching when I'm when I'm watching the videos, wh- what should I be paying attention to? I think all right, here's where the yoga or or have I just not got to those videos yet where it's it's more obvious? Right. So right now there's not. I haven't put up the the Yo Chi Yang fusion videos. Okay. I've started off with Qigong flow. I call it Qigong flow because it's we we don't stop between movements and and become to come back to um, the original posture. So many Qigong forms, they have like an opening and a closing for every single movement, but I don't do that. Instead, I just flow from one posture to the next and I'll integrate some yoga postures, forward bends or warriors into it. Um, but really right now, what you'll see on my offerings is Qigong flow and yin yoga. And next year, I'm going to start the videos for the Yo Chi Yang, which is integrating, um, because I want to, I want to present it in a way that's really digestible, and um, it's like I'm, I'm working on it to, to pr- how I'm going to present this, because I'm also teaching this to the students, and it can become so complicated. So, right. yeah, right now I've kept them quite separate. What I, what I really like to do it too is to do some Qigong before yin yoga or do yin yoga and stand, roll up slowly and then you can go into Qigong flow and it's a really beautiful practice. Mm, excellent. Okay, well, that's, that's good to know. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons I appreciated your, your work so much is because uh, it seems well thought out and not goofy. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I appreciate knowing that, you know, you, you definitely have this, uh, th- this kind of approach. You know, one of the things I've noticed when people begin getting kind of into meditation, they become, can become sort of very fanatic, fanatical about it. And they, they tend to, uh, I wouldn't say ignore, but not pay so much attention to integrating it into their normal life situation. So um, my next question is, when, when someone is decided that they really want to engage in, in, a, in a meditative or, or, or yogic path for, for increasing their awareness or, or becoming more spiritually conscious or just feeling better, I suppose, um, what do you recommend for people to do maybe throughout the day? Are, are there any little things they can do throughout the day without having to do a, a formal Qigong practice, something that they can, they can take with them and maybe do when they're just standing in line at the grocery store or driving down the road? Is, is there anything, uh, any advice you would give to people? Well, there's a few things. I mean, one, Dantian breathing or deep abdominal breathing, this is something that we all, we all teach how to relax the chest and sink the breath down into your belly. So becoming aware of the breath and and the breath in the belly, in the abdomen. So you could do that in the car, in the line at the grocery store. I often, in the line at the store, I'll adjust my structure. And if you learn how to stand in wuji posture, that's one of the first things I teach in a class. And just bringing that alignment in so that you're, your central core channels aligned with heaven and earth and the feet are grounded and then breathing and boom, I feel my energy like balance align, you know, and then you can start to notice where am I holding tension in the body, unnecessary tension. And that unnecessary tension is, is a, it's a great indicator of, 
of blockage of stress um, so that the chi is where the chi isn't flowing. And so we do these practices to un unblock the chi, especially our warmups. Mm -hmm. And so if throughout the day you can identify those areas and, and consciously relax them or massage it a little bit and then relax it, you're bringing awareness into those areas that are holding the tension. Mm -hmm. And the third is emotions. In the Tao, emotions are one of the greatest causes of illness. Mm -hmm. So becoming aware of um, how emotions arise, when they arise, and how we react in situations, and then working with that energy, because it's a huge amount of energy that we produce through emotions. And this is actually like a resource, because emotions aren't bad, but if we, if we hold on to them, they do harm to the body. So we want to take these frequencies and understand all the different frequencies of emotions, and then we can learn how to transform them and balance them and then transform them through love. And this is a part of spiritual growth. And it is a part of a meditation practice because part of meditation when you sit down is you have faced yourself and all this stuff starts to arise. So during the day, these things are arising all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what is, you know, you mentioned the idea of working with the emotions. So from, from your perspective, can you give an example of say, an emotion that might come up in, in one way of, of helping to either process that or, or integrate that for someone. So anger, we could just use anger, is, um, is a common emotion. And this is a very young emotion and we, it's a hot, right? We get angry, we get hot and the chi rises. So it, it rises up to the head, the face becomes hot, the eyes bulge, it's actually connected to the liver in Chinese medicine, the liver gets hot. So when you recognize these, these sensations, this heat and this rising energy and how it's affecting your nervous system, how it's affecting your body, then you immediately know, okay, I'm out of balance. I'm too young, I'm too hot, I'm no in no fit situation to think rationally, to talk to this person or this whatever I need to do like it's not the time because often when we get angry we react and we react in the wrong way because we're at reacting from this state which is an imbalanced state so what we need to do is we need to bring ourselves back into the center into balance and we do that by cooling down you know in Thailand we say Jai Yen Yen which means cool heart so we cool down so you want to do breathing slow, deep breathing. You want to do some, if you're into Qigong, you do some cooling Qigong exercise, some very yin, some water. You bring that water energy in to balance the heat. So we have like the fountain. You might know the fountain from my videos. Mm -hmm. um, you can do the fountain, you can do the, and relax and cool down. And then come to the heart center, bring in the love. The love is the master frequency for transformation, loving self, looking at the situation and then come back to where you were. Okay, now I'm gonna to talk to this person. Now I'm going to address this email or whatever it is. Um, and it will really help. Excellent. Really. Okay. Yeah. Well, good. Um, <clears throat> so far, I mean, you, you've answered so many of the questions that I've had about Qigong and, and, and how to, to integrate it for people who are uh, you know, interested in the yogic and meditation path. Um, just for the, the final portion of our time together, do you have any general advice for people who have an interest in having a, a consistent, serious meditation practice and also uh, Qigong or, or the work that you do? Any advice you would give them to help keep their meditation balanced uh, through a practice like Qigong? Uh, well, consistency is the key. So even if it's just 20 minutes a day, this is really important. And then, you know, on weekends or when you have more time to do that longer, deeper, intense practice, and then just maintain 20 minutes a day throughout the week. And you'll keep that line of energy flowing because if you, it's, if you do like, I'm going to do three hours every day and you do that for like three days, but then you don't do it for like two weeks, then it is just gone and you have to start all over again. So it's like a roller coaster. But if you 
kick it off with a nice practice. You know, you do a course, you take a class, you do a video, whatever it is, your, your own practice. And then you maintain that throughout the week, just 20 minutes a day. This is very, very effective. And of course, we have a wealth of information out there online now. So whether it's the Yochi videos or your classes online, I mean, there's so many teachers and wonderful programs. And it depends on what your goal is with meditation. Because um, if you're going for like out inner alchemy meditation, or, or what you're doing, Kriya Yoga is working with energy and what I teach is alchemy, working with energy. There's definite step by step, you know, to digest and assimilate the energy as you want to grow it. You want to find a good teacher and a program and start with the basics and then build up your energy slowly over time. And one master said, it's like energy works like putting one sheet of rice paper on top of another mm. every day. It's, it takes time and patience and, but eventually boom, like it, when the channels open, then it's, it's really, really powerful. And it can happen so fast now with this new age that we're, you know, opening up to on the whole planet with the shift. So just start somewhere and, and be consistent. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for, for, for being here today. And um, again, if people want to find out more about your work or, or uh, learn about your videos, they can go to yochi.com, Y-O-Q-I.com, as well as um, youtube.com slash Y-O-Q-I, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so thank you again for being here. It was really a pleasure. And I, I can't thank wait you, to, to share this with, with our listeners. Thank you so much. Well, yeah, contact me anytime and I hope we, we meet again. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs>